God's blessings to you this first day of the new year. What a joy to be in God's house this day and to worship and to have communion as God's family together. We welcome you to worship if you are a guest today and have no church home. We invite you to consider making this your church home. We welcome our friends online who are worshiping with us online. There is a fellowship pad, a friendship pad on your pew. If you will please take that and register your attendance, it would be most appreciated. And for those who are online, if you would check in and log in with your attendance on the fellowship pad that's online, that would be greatly appreciated. I have several announcements to call your attention to. They are all in the box. This is the sign-up box. Please read this and note there are several sign-ups, Coffee and Conversation, Financial Peace University, uh, a pastor's class, Dr. Pittman will be starting Twisting the Truth two weeks from today. There's a Gen Y Sycamore, a new adult group for those in the 20s and 30s who are invited to attend some events an in-betweeners gathering, an annual family campion. All of those are in the box, so if you will please check uh, and make sure that you sign of your interest on the tables this morning. Journeys begins January the 11th, and we happen to think that it is so good in children's ministries, adult ministries, and student ministries that we're going to give you a free dinner on Wednesday. But you need to let us know you're coming. And the only catch is that we hope you will come to a class. We will feed you food and hopefully feed you food for the soul, too. So check it out and come to Journeys for a free meal uh, in January, starting January the 11th. There is an undecorating the tree, uh, undecorating the church that's going on. There is a prayer time in the chapel January the 6th. And there are other announcements that are in the bulletin. Please take the bulletin and see what will fit into your life so that you can serve in the mission and witness of Christ through the Sycamore Church. Dr. Kent. Thank you. Nothing like starting out the new year with a congregational meeting. We have one housekeeping item that we need to take care of. The nominating committee learned that Jason Harvey would be unable to fulfill his term as a part of the class of 2014 on the session. The nominating committee has put forward the name of Mr. David Sperry, already an ordained elder, to serve as a replacement and to fill this vacated spot. The meeting has been called to order already by worship at the 8.45 and 9.45 hours. So we do have a quorum, and the motion is put before you to accept in nomination the name of David Sperry as an elder for the class of 2014. That does not need a second because it is put forward by the nominating committee, but are there any questions about the motion? If not, it would be uh, appropriate to cast an affirmative ballot honoring the recommendation of the nominating committee to place uh, David Sperry as an elder in the class of 2014. So moved. Moved. Support. All signify support of the motion by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Since David's at this service and is planning on being installed, I'm really glad you voted in the affirmative. (laughs) Thank you so much. The motion has carried and our congregational meeting is concluded with a moment of prayer. Loving God, thank you for the privilege of work to do and for your spirit that always leads us forward to the glory of Christ, our loving Lord. Amen. And now Don Vincerette will lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. Happy New Year. Good morning. Please join me in a call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Nations shall come to your light.
join me in a prayer of confession, followed by a moment for your personal confession. God of glory, you sent Jesus among us as the light of the world to reveal your love for all people. We confess that our sin and pride hide the brightness of your light. We turn away from the poor. We ignore cries for justice. We do not strive for peace. In your mercy, cleanse us of our sin and baptize us once again with your spirit that, forgiven and renewed, we may show forth your glory shining in the face of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Friends, believe the gospel. Most of you have some familiarity with these words. They come from the gospel writer Matthew about the visit of the Magi to Bethlehem. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 1497 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible. And if some of you have thought afresh about beginning your journey this year with Scripture by using a one-year or two-year Bible, see me after the service. I still have a few extra. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, In the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I, too, may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of the Lord. 
I'd like to invite the children who are here at this service to come down and be with me for just a moment together. Please. bring down what is this candle Candle. would you call this a teeny candle or a great big giant candle it is great big giant candle in fact I took it from our advent wreath this is the big candle in the center and it's called the Christ candle that's because it shows us that the light of Jesus is really the biggest light going. And we light it on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day as a special way of remembering that it's on this day that Jesus is born. Now, I want to show you something about this candle, and I need some helping hands. Could I please have the lights dimmed? Take them all the way down. There we go. And we can hit them at the back, too, if you would. There we go. Now, if you're in a place that's dark and a candle is burning, what do you look at first? Where, is your, where are your eyes going to go? If you're all alone in a room and it's totally dark and there's a candle burning, you're going to know your way. Yeah, you're going to look at the candle so you know your way. Now, everybody stay put, okay, because it is burning. But you notice, too, that there's something about all of us that starts to be... There's something about us all that looks a little brighter when the light is nearer to us. I shouldn't do too much of this. But if this room was totally dark, and I put it right here, all of our faces would glow a little bit. And they're supposed to, because being near to Christ ought to make us glow a little bit. You see, we call Jesus the light. In fact, the Bible calls him the light. Because he's the one that helps us see our way. He shows us what God is like. He reminds us of what it means to love, to forgive, to be a friend to somebody things that God says are very important. So you and I have a connection to this. You can't go to school carrying this, correct? And I'm not going to walk up the aisle carrying this either. But we're called to carry it where? You carry Jesus' light in your heart when you're a friend to somebody When you remember to be kind, when you listen to your parents, when you try to be a good citizen, and when you let others know that you want to be their friend. That's carrying the light of Christ. We may not always see it burning with a flame. The flame's in our heart, and it's the love we show to one another. Now, Reverend Hutchins is going to be talking this morning about living the light. You're called to live it too. Live it from your heart. And people will know something very special is shining. It'll be the light of Christ. Will you pray with me? Loving God, thank you. Thank you that your light puts out any darkness. And thank you for giving us something to share that makes all the difference. (laughs) as you've done. Through Christ Jesus, our living Lord, we pray. Amen. 
Now we can turn the lights back up. Thank you. You can go back to your seats.
Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come this day to worship the first day of the new year, and every day is a first day for us. Every day is a new day, a new beginning, a time to walk with you and to renew our lives in you. May it be so this day. Renew us, refresh us, strengthen us, that we may go from this service empowered to love, to serve, and to let our light shine for others in your name. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. $480 million worth of one item has been purchased since the mid-90s, since it was invented. $480 $480 million for one item. And it was a fluke when it was created because it was created just to draw people into a store to make it stand out and be different from the other stores in the area. If a person wanted to purchase this item and you didn't get it when you first saw it, there was no chance of you getting it after. Because the item sold out so fast at Christmas that rain checks were delivered a year later. Manufacturing could not keep up with this item. Now this item can be found at Halloween, Easter, Valentine's Day, and in red, white, and blue for patriotic holidays. The item in mentioned is icicle lights. $480 million in icicle lights have been sold since they were invented. Now I love lights. I absolutely adore lights. I love going to look at them as a child. I love going out in the neighborhoods and seeing lights on houses. I love communities that put up luminaires. I love churches that put the luminaires out on Christmas Eve. I just think it makes the church look alive, that something's going on, and it invites people to come in and find out what all is going on. But I absolutely love Christmas lights. And there is someone who lives in Mason, Ohio, best as I can tell, the person still lives there. His name is Carson Williams. Name not familiar, is it? If you saw his house on the internet, oh, saw a head nod, mm mm-hmm. He took a picture, took a video of his house in 2004. It got posted on the internet. It went viral before viral was viral. There are more than 10 million hits to look at his house. In fact, it drew so much much attention when it went on the Internet. He's been on CNN. He's been on the Today Show. He has uh, co-authored a commercial uh, for a product. He's had his 15 minutes of fame, and he became so famous that the Mason police said, you have got to unplug your lights. It's not safe for people to come down this road and look at the lights. He had synchronized 16,000 lights to a computer and was playing it through um, a radio station, a low-frequency radio station, and you could pick it up in your car, listen to the music, and watch the light display. It's one of the first times it had ever really been done, and he's made his own business at it it now. His name is Carson Williams, local resident, and I'm sh- assuming he still lives here, best I could tell, in Cincinnati, Ohio, in Mason, Ohio. Ten million people have looked at those Christmas lights, so I'm not the only one who likes Christmas lights. I love lights in every shape, color, and fashion. I love them from the tastefully tacky to the extremely tacky to downright gaudy and uh, Uh, You'd wonder about the taste. I love the simplicity of some of the lights. I just love Christmas lights because those Christmas lights shatter darkness. They make the world look so bright on a night that is so dark. And I grieved in 1973. 1973. Some of you are old enough to remember we were told to not put up Christmas lights that year. There was an energy crisis. We were told not to decorate the gas, the mileage on the interstate went down from 70 to 55 miles an hour because of the energy crisis. The world was really dark in 1973. There were no Christmas lights to be found. And then slowly, one by one, brave souls began to put them up. And now the world is again bright with Christmas lights. 
I look at those Christmas lights and I translate that to the light of Christ shining in the darkness. And I hope for every house that has a Christmas light that there is the light of Christ shining in the soul of the person that put those lights up. And for every house that may not know the light of Christ or may live into the light of Christ, may they come to know the light of Christ through that brightness. Because Christmas lights are only a small, 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 tiny, tiny portion of the brilliance that Christ brings into our life, the light of life. The Gospel of Matthew is about light. It's about life. The Gospel of Matthew has these wise men or these travelers or astrologers traveling to look at this huge star in the night. And they go to find he that is born king of the Jews. And they go to place where the king should be born, which was in the city of Jerusalem. But baby Jesus wasn't there. But these travelers left their home. They left these safe places. And they go and seek someone they had never seen in their life. They stayed on task. They go to Jerusalem. He's not here. Here it says, come back. And so when you find him, you come back and tell me and I'll go worship him. Well, no, they didn't do that. They didn't go back because they were warned it wasn't a good thing to go back. Herod was not going to be truthful to his word. But these men, these travelers stayed on task. Because he wasn't in the first place, they went on to the second place. And they went on till they found the baby. I find that astounding. They didn't quit. They didn't give up. They followed the light until they found the source of the light. And I'm astounded that God made a light so bright that it could guide these travelers through nights and nights and nights of travel because it wasn't just a one-night journey that was being made. And they brought gifts to this baby. They brought gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. In today's market, I I researched and it said it was probably about a million dollars worth of gifts they brought. But these gifts sustained the family because this baby was in danger. Herod was out to kill this baby. And the mama and the earthly daddy took baby Jesus into Egypt and they could live there on these resources. This amazing God supplied an earthly means to protect Christ, to protect his own son by being killed from a tyrant king. And this God that we worship is about light and life, and his son is all about light. Jesus is all about smashing darkness, about crushing evil, about banishing misery and pain and hurt and wiping away tears. Jesus is about turning mourning into dancing and about crying into laughter. Jesus is about shining into the darkest places of our life where there is sludge and there is rot and there is stink and there's nothing that we ever want to deal with. Jesus is about cleaning that out and getting it out of our life forever so that we can shine and let others know of the light of Christ in our life. The story of Matthew is a story I want to read every January the 1st. I want to read the story. I want to hear the story. I want to savor the story. Not because it's just about light and life, but because it's about listening. It's about obedience. It's about change. It's about protecting. It's about God providing what is needed, not what is wanted, but what is needed. It's about worshiping an astounding God with an entire heart, mind, soul, and spirit. And it's about going home another way. Verse 12 says, Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. There is a way we always go home, and we're used to that path. But sometimes we need to change the path because God will give us a new path. The destination where we end up is going to be the same place because it will be with God. But sometimes God changes the path and says, go home a different way. I can tell you firsthand that it's not easy to go home a different way or to carry this light of Christ or to live the light of Christ. From personal experience, I can tell you that the death of a dear loved one or a friend will want to smother the light and to take away anything we have or I have in my life of wanting to live. I can tell you that having not having enough resources of time or a warm place to live or the right kind of clothes to wear or the right kind of shoes or or having a decent car or having enough financial base, I can tell you that attacks the light of Christ. I can tell you that causes a person to hoard, to hover, and to bury the light of Christ. 
I can also say from firsthand experience that I have moved in places where I had no idea of knowing anybody. I had no family. I had no friends. I had no one in my presence except the light of Christ to bring me to a place. One of those places was Cincinnati, Ohio. I knew no one when I moved here. But God provided a light and gave me a family through that light. I can tell you that there is no redeeming value in darkness. Darkness looks pretty good. You want to go live there, but it will take everything from you. It will drain you of resources. But the light, the light is what we live for. It's not enough to tell you about the light because you also have stories about light you can tell me and what stories we could share and the faith we could express about living the light of Christ. I have in my office this piece of pottery. It comes from Seagrove. The Lufkin family made it. And it's not every piece of pottery that you get that has a cross on the bottom with prayers that go with it. But this is called a witness crock. And their idea is that we want to live our lives like this. We want people to see our lives like this. But our lives are really like this. There is... Every time there is a pain or a sorrow or a hurt or an agony in our life, it tears at us. But we don't want people to see it. Christ's light can't shine through that. But Christ's light shines through every pain and hurt and agony there is in the world. There's a long list of things that come with this crock. But the Creator wants our love to shine through the power of Christ in the cracks and wants the light of Christ to shine through those cracks to mend a broken world, to let others know that there is a light of Christ made by a wonderful God and given to us. This light of Christ is healing. It tells of love. And we are called to shine our light through these things we don't think are gifts but they call us to make a witness to what God has done in our life and how the light can shine through these things in our life that we didn't want, that we didn't ask for, but have come our way. So my prayer for us is that may God give us the strength, the courage, the wisdom, and the grace, the love and the creativity to live this light through the cracks and the holes in our life, to live the light of Christ And not only let the light of Christ transform our lives, but the lives of those God places in our path. Go out and live the light of Christ. Amen and amen. Be seated. Thank you. 
Friends, I hope that all of us could offer the same kind of passion and enthusiasm in our service that Shirley's just demonstrated in her message. This is really a blessed time in our wider life and work, and it is with a sense of real joy that this morning we install and ordain uh, our new officers to their new positions for this year. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. I know it's a holiday, and yet with three services, you know, been a lot of folk from this church family in worship today. At this time, I'd like to invite our new officers, those who've been newly elected and those who are serving second terms, to please come forward. Our elders are going to be in the center. Our deacons are going to be on the pulpit side, and our trustees are going to be on the piano side. Would you please come forward at this time? And my information is we have all of our officers here. I want to thank you. What I'd like to do, too, because these are persons who've been elected from our life by you to provide key leadership to our congregation during this particular time of growth and expansion, mindful that we have the privilege of serving more and touching more lives. I'd like folk to know who you are uh, kindly. Uh, Our trustees include Noel Breckis. Noel's here. There you go. Ken McWhorter, Bill Barnhill, Hugh Shin. If the elders would also turn around, our elders include Ernie Tong, Melinda Skinner, Carlos Jimenez, Errol Everson, Rick Strait, and there's Rick. Come on down. Need you down. <laughs> Thank you. That's fine. And newly elected David Sperry. (laughs) Thank you. Come on over, Rick. Thank you. And our deacons include Linda Hill, Luann Canavy, Gerald Hewlett, Carol Wilkinson, Nancy Roll, Tim Connor. Thank you, friends. Now you may turn back to the front. Friends, we have talked about their particular affirmations you are asked to make, first to our elders and deacons, and then lastly we'll turn to our trustees. To our deacons and elders, these questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith? And will you live out the calling that we are ministers to one another as you lead the people of God. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture? Will you be governed by our church's polity? Will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? And for our elders... Will you be a faithful elder watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in the government and discipline of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? And for our deacons, 
Will you be faithful deacons teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's attention to the friendless and those who are in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Now, for those being ordained, uh, we would invite you briefly to kneel on the carpeted area. And I'd like to invite any present uh, elders who are in the service or any ministers of the gospel to also come forward for the laying on of hands. Please, Don. Shall we pray? Dearest Lord God, touch these, your servants, with the special breath of your spirit, giving them a wisdom beyond their own, giving them a love that's overflowing in their heart, giving them a true joy of service, and through their witness to so move your church that we would have the pe- be the people you have called us to be and that we too might serve you with a fresh sense of commitment and privilege, honoring Jesus Christ in all that we do and are. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, let me invite you to stand. Thank you. Bless you. And now I would invite you all to turn and face the trustees. Our friends, God has given you special gifts to serve him. And you really have been chosen for a very unique work. Under the law of this state, you will hold and manage properties and as authorized, conduct business for the church. By your energy, honesty, and fairness, you will demonstrate Christian faith to those you deal with on our behalf. One question. Do you promise to give the business affairs of this congregation your devoted attention, to encourage generosity, and in all your dealings, work to further our service of Christ in the world? If so, please say, I do. And to the congregation... Do you receive these persons as your trustees, and do you promise to support them in their work for the church? If so, please say, we do. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the work we have to do, for the light we have to carry. Help us to do it with excellence, with heart, and in a way that pleases you always, to the glory of your loving name. Amen. You all are duly installed, and all you say and do serve Jesus Christ with joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. And we turn to a time of prayer in our life, remembering that any time we gather, there are particular persons in our life who may know a time of challenge, stress, uncertainty. And we've been invited to add to that list today uh, the name of Greg Johnson. Uh, Greg covets your prayers as he awaits heart surgery this week. Many of you know Greg best by his work on the board or as the drummer for our praise band. And we wish him all of God's healing energy and love during this time of awaiting surgery and the surgery to come. Let's open our hearts to God in prayer. Loving God, your light is bigger than us. Draw us into the flame of your care. Give us a heart to carry the good news of your life-changing love into our relationships, into every pathway that we are privileged to walk. Grant, we pray, that even in our heart and life, it might be apparent to others 
that your light has shined upon us and that we welcomed it gladly. Dear Lord, for those for whom this first day of the year is a time of special challenge, cradle them in your care. Grant them the awareness of your nearness, the comfort of your help, and the power of your healing strength. For them and for every need, made real in Christ our loving Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we turn to our tithes and offerings, some of you will appreciate the reminder that if you have yet to take advantage of the opportunity to demonstrate your commitment to support God's work, here at Sycamore in the coming year, by making your pledge, doing so soon will be a great aid and encouragement to your officers who are trying to prepare a budget. And if you're online and you've forgotten to do so, you would be appreciative of knowing that you can also pledge online. That's a new opportunity for this year. We open our hearts to God, remembering that God's love for us is overflowing Now, with gladness, may we continue our worship by sharing in our tithes and offerings. Friends, on our own, none of us has a right to be at this table. But if you are hungry for God's goodness, if you yearn to have your life filled with a strength greater than yourself, 
a love that truly sets you free, then you have a reserved seat at this table. We remember the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as recorded by the Apostle Paul, who wrote, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat, and do this remembering me. In the same way also, he poured the cup out after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of it, do this remembering me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, with a spirit of prayer and expectation, we ask God to take these very common, ordinary elements and set them apart for God's extraordinary purpose that in receiving them, our faith might be strengthened and our lives brought even closer into life with God. Will you please pray with me? Lord, as only you can, stir our hearts, consecrate our lives, draw us nearer to you, to the glory of Christ, our living Lord. Amen. For on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do this remembering me.
God's perfect love for your life. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper and poured it out, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of it, do this remembering me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
perfect care for you, Don. The one who poured it all out hopes to fill you and me. Let us receive his grace together. Please pray with me. Lord God, let the light of your love be so in our heart that living will mean living for you. To the glory of your loving name we pray. Amen. class is for another day and another time, but what you don't know, that piece of clay had to land directly on center of the wheel. It had to be brought up with the potter's arms tucked in and had to come straight up. It had to have a good foundation, and once it had the good foundation, all the lights and the cuts in it can be made. Yeah. Yeah. You are to go out and know that you have been created for God, made by God, and there will be things in life that will come to you, but your foundation is sure, the light of Christ is sure, and when those times come, understand that all those cuts and frays and marks and knots and things that come into our lives allow the light of Christ to shine through us so that we might shine for others and others will know of God's goodness and grace in their life too. So go out and live, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave us Christ, the light of the world, that we might live eternally in the light with Christ everlasting. Go forth and live the light of Christ. Amen and amen.